Welcome, Rick. Thank you. Nice to be here. <laughs> Great to have you here. Rick is going to be one of 32 authors at the Holiday Book Festival, Saturday, November 30th, at Kensington Mill Falls Events. That's located in Milford, Michigan, uh, right on the main drag. So that will be fabulous. So welcome, Rick. You um, listed in your bio, um, in your registration, that you are going to be bringing five book titles. Can you tell us about those books? Sure. Um, uh, I'll even, I'll talk, tell and show. show oh, we like show and tell. So uh, this is my first published novel, uh, World War II action adventure story. Uh, a lot of factual information is woven into it, but it is a novel. And in this, uh, in th in this story, a young man from Indiana, Jim Yoder, accidentally falls out the open bomb bay of his B-24 while on a mission over Nazi Germany. So thanks to his chest parachute, he survives. But there he is on foot, on the ground, and watching his buddies fly back to England. And so uh, Gunner's run. He's a machine gunner. He's making a run across Europe trying to get back to England. But the Germans are on his trail right behind him a few steps <laughs> all the way. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of intrigue, and I had fun doing the research for this novel to 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 write in to weave in a lot of factual information, realistic things. And I, I'll tell you a, a fun story about it. Uh, a woman came up to me, a friend of mine, and she said, "My father got that book of yours that has the plane on the cover, and he used to fly those planes in World War II." And immediately I blurted out, oh, no, if there's anybody who can find mistakes in the book, it's going to be the guys who flew the planes. <laughs> uh, but then she said, oh, no, my dad loved your story. And as a matter of fact, he remembers all the things you talk about. And he thinks you must be about 90 years old, too. <laughs> and, and, she, and her next sentence was, when he got done with it, he turned to my mom and said, you've got to read this. It will bring back memories. So that made me feel really good that my research uh, was complete enough and uh, thorough enough that he thought that I was his age, and I wasn't born until many years after World War II was over. <laughs> and uh, and but he eventually did want to meet me, invited me over to his home, and uh, gave me some World War II mementos that he'd been saving all these decades. Uh, it, it told me some of his real life his adventures. So that was a a real fun evening. That's awesome. So which other, which other book titles do you have? Well, I've got uh, a couple more that uh, involve flyers. Uh, my dad was not in the Air Force, but he, uh, he was a pilot all of his life. So airplanes are always in the background of my creative thinking. Uh, <laughs> I've got one that's a suspense novel called, uh, it, it's, it's uh, the Methuselah Project. In World War II, the, uh, the Germans did do lots of experiments on human beings uh, and just based on that loose beginning, my mind began to wonder, what if, what if there was one secret project that did not stop with World War II? And so that uh, came up with the, the Methuselah Project, uh, a project in which an American airman was used as a guinea pig. And World War II ended, but the Methuselah Project did not. And as a matter of fact, he did not know that it had ended. And I could tell you more, but the, that's no point in, <laughs> that's in the book. <laughs> And uh, it, it got a, a, enough wonderful reviews on Amazon and other places that I, I wrote a, another one. This is uh, the Methuselah Project SOS. Uh, after the conclusion of the first book, uh, somebody that he meets in that first story is going through a, a, a traumatic time. Matter of fact, she ends up kidnapped by an organization that I, I won't try to explain right now. But uh, so he is pulled back into this uh, fighting this organization that he does not want to have anything to do with in the first place. And, uh, it, you know, in, in books so often, I hear readers say things like, I liked the first book, but the second one, eh, it wasn't quite so good. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason for that is because a lot of authors are under pressure from their, uh, from their agent or from the publisher to really crank out the next one after a successful story. Mm -hmm. And so I was aware of that tendency for people to not be so impressed with the second story. So I kept in the back of my mind, always thinking, ramp it up, more tension, more energy. And if you were to compare those two books on the Amazon ratings, uh, book number two actually scores higher. Uh, book one does fine, but the second book scores higher as far as the, the number of star ratings that people give to it. Nice. I, I've got uh, three that are um, 
So I have two other ones that are actually four young adults. Uh, one of them is a fantasy book. This was actually the first novel that I wrote, A Curious Quest. And mm -hmm. it's fantasy, kind of like uh, Chronicles of Narnia, different story. Okay. Of uh, but it was not my first book published. Back in those days, uh, I was having a harder time getting fantasy published. And so I just, several publishers turned it down and I just set it aside. And that's when I went on to, to start writing Gunner's Run. But uh, it was eventually published and it's still out there. Uh, people are still buying it. And then my, uh, some years ago, for an organization called Focus on the Family, they contacted me and wanted me to write uh, a science fiction story for teenage guys. And uh, actually, the editor telephoned me and he said, uh, Rick, we want something big, something different, maybe fantasy, maybe science fiction. I don't know, maybe both mixed together. Just make it big and exciting. Mm -hmm. And I told the editor, Mike, that's a tall order, but I'll think about it. I'll, I'll see what I can come up with. And eventually I wrote a three part sh series of short stories for them. Mm -hmm. Writing gig. It, it was an assignment. And it was fun, but after it was over, it was over. I, I took my money and proceeded on with other writing projects. <laughs> but uh, in the back of my mind, it's like the characters in, in that story, which I called the next 50th, they would not let me go. It's almost like they kept coming to me in my sleep saying, write us into a novel, expand the story. So eventually I did that. I expanded the story. I took my initial beginning, which was less than 5,000 words, and, and wrote it into an uh, 80,000 ah. word novel called The Next Fithian. It's uh, about a young man from Indiana. I live in Indiana, so it makes the research simpler if I write about people from <laughs> where I'm from. And this young man from Indiana, he's aboard an aircraft headed to an archaeological dig in the Mideast, but the aircraft comes under fire by a terrorist, and it blows up, and he finds himself transported to another, another world, another galaxy. Actually, more technically, another dimension. And there is a way to get back home, which is what he wants, but uh, it's it's not simple. So that's uh, that's a standalone adventure for people who, uh, kind of like for young people who like Marvel adventures. Uh, that's mm -hmm. what I had in mind, uh, a Marvel type adventure. So uh, that that was fun to write. But uh, there are a lot of writers who choose one niche that they stick in the only westerns or only romance or only mm -hmm. Amish stories. And I'm kind of across the board, um, but I enjoy the variety that these different types of stories have provided for me. And, and my readers seem to stick with me, too. Awesome. Well, that is great. So you said that you've, um, your dad was a pilot. Yes. Uh, yes. And in your bio, it says that you've jumped from perfectly good airplanes. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> True. I never learned to fly airplanes. I, I, I mean, I've assisted. I, I have a brother who had an aerial photography business, and he, if he couldn't find, if his wife was busy, uh, he would ask me, could I go for a flight? And uh, we would fly over construction sites, for example, that had hired him to take pictures of their plant being built month by month. And I would handle the controls while he's taking pictures out the window, and anybody could do that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I've never learned to fly. But what I did do was... Uh, for this book, when my main character, Jim Yoder, falls out the open Bombay of his uh, B-24 over Germany, I wanted to experience uh, some of those feelings uh, of, you know, falling, free fall, uh, mm -hmm. feeling the wind. And, and, and so uh, I signed up for the jump uh, for the course and uh, had enough fun that uh, I did it again. But I, I tell you, the, the very first time I went, they, they had told us, uh, we used static line parachutes in those days. Mm -hmm. and you, you would jump, you were hooked up just like in the military. And after you fell 40 feet or so, it would automatically deploy. It would pop your chute for you. And ah. they, said that, they said that if you haven't felt it by that time, go ahead and go for your reserve. And, ah. and so they taught us to count 1,000, 2,000, up to 6,000. And if you hadn't felt it by coming out by 6,000, you should go for your reserve. And when I let go of that airplane wing and I started falling, I had never fallen so fast in my life without holding on to something. And uh, rather than saying 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, what came out of my mouth, mouth was more like, whoa. <laughs> I, yeah. I felt my stomach went from here to here just that fast. But it was, it was fun. And I think it helped to make it more realistic as I tried to capture the feelings of my young 19-year-old airman as he experienced basically the same free fall that I felt. That is dedication to research. <laughs> I'm not sure I could do that. So 
I don't think I'll have any of my characters jumping out of the planes. <laughs> Imagination will take you so far, and talking to people who have been there and done it will take you a little bit farther. But this this was the case where I'd always had in the back of my mind that I should try that someday. Mm -hmm. Well, this book kind of pushed me over the brink of uh, maybe I should, and yeah, I'm going to do it. <laughs> Closest I've come is indoor skydiving at iFly. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, okay, I've seen that done, but I've never tried that. Yeah, lots of fun. <laughs> <laughs> so just looking at your bio here, you've climbed mountains, you've jumped out of airplanes, toured World War II battlefields and visited. Wow, you have quite the background when you go and visit the battlegrounds and everything, is that more research or is that just for fun? Well, it it's an interest of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, just, just to back up a little bit, why in the world did I even start writing stories involving World War II airmen? I can remember I was in, it was Christmas of my seventh grade year visiting mm -hmm. relatives in Detroit. And the, it was a big house. People were all, all over the house from the basement to uh, upstairs. And at one point, I left the kids, and I joined the men in the living room who had, who had turned down a World War II movie called The Great Escape. Mm -hmm. And the movie was well, well started when I sat down, so everybody was already quiet. Nobody was saying anything. So I just started watching this movie. Mm -hmm. And when it got all done and they started rolling before the credits, there was a message there that scrolled that said that this movie was dedicated to the 50 men who had uh, died attempting to escape from a German uh, POW camp. And at that point in my brain, the thought clicked, what? This stuff really happened? I, I thought it was just a movie, something that some mm -hmm. Hollywood screenplay writer had you know, written up. And that sparked in me an idea uh, that I should find out more about what people really went through in World War II. So young age, I, I, I started checking out of the library other escape stories and uh, other things about uh, that people had experienced in the war. And I personally, I'm not the kind of historian who would be interested in reading a, an overview of Patton's third army swinging this way or a pincer movement between two different <laughs> armies this way. I wanted to read first person accounts, people who were there, they experienced it and, and, and explained and described what they saw, what they felt uh, as they were escaping, evading or, or whatever the case may be. And uh, that kind of spilled over into uh, becoming more and more interested in uh, finding out other aspects of the war. And eventually it was in the back of my mind when I began writing about uh, different kinds of stories. So I've done some short stories based on World War II. And, and then, of course, the, the novels that I've been talking about. Uh, that, that's how I got launched in that direction. <laughs> so you're, when you went over to the World War II battlefields, that yeah. was for more research and... It, 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 yeah, personal interest, but also research. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I would think that the most famous place that I was in that regard was on the coast of France. Uh, you've probably heard of the D-Day beaches, mm -hmm. uh, Juno, Sword, and, and those other beaches. Uh, matter of fact, uh, when I was on that, uh, that beach where the Americans did their storming and, and tried to come up the walls, um, the cliffs, uh, I, I took along specifically plastic containers. I, I brought back a container of sand from that beach just for personal oh, interest. Oh. Uh, I, I've got a room in my home that I call it my war room. <laughs> and uh, for years I've visited antique malls and I've collected odds and ends, uh, not reproductions. I wanted real old furniture and real old mementos from World mm -hmm. War II. And uh, so I, I've got a old fashioned jar of old fashioned sand from, from that <laughs> beach. Uh, but uh, yeah, that was mainly for personal interest, but I, I think it helps to round out my knowledge uh, mm -hmm. of World War II as a writer. And uh, a lot of writers who don't put in any kind of uh, extracurricular research, you could say, I mm -hmm. think there's the writing kind of lacks it. They, they, they don't know enough to infuse their, their words, their pages with small details and just little bits of information that would really help to beef it up and to make it seem more realistic, like somebody who had been there knew what they were talking about. Hmm. So you have visited Eastern Europe over 50 times. 
Right, right. Uh, and that's not just, uh, that's primarily not war related, uh, although okay. I have been places in uh, Eastern Europe, so Ukraine in particular, uh, mm. Russia also, where battles have taken place. Uh, matter of fact, uh, I, I work for a nonprofit organization, and very often I've been involved in things like uh, helping uh, local churches over there to uh, host uh, children's camps, children's summer camps, just oh, a, a okay. wholesome good activity in the summertime. Uh, the kids get good nourishment. They get to play wacky games and competitions, <laughs> things like that. And uh, we were holding one on the property of a church one time, and uh, it got to a point in the day where on the first day of camp where the adults said, okay, let's go down to the field for, for game time. And so we start heading off down this dirt road to what they call the field. And the, the road kind of wound up. And then as we were approaching it, I see this big concrete bunker sitting on top of this hill. And yeah, there's a field around it. But I, I was just immediately amazed. I thought, I didn't know that there was anything like that around here. And they said, oh yeah, there, there's a string of them on, all along this western side of the city of Kiev. And I, I was fascinated. So <laughs> immediately I had to be involved in playing games and competitions with the kids. But in the back of my mind was, I want to go explore that bunker. And uh, <laughs> because, of course, it was it's pitch black. That's an mm -hmm. understatement to say pitch black. I had to wait till later on uh, that evening. I got a flashlight. And I asked some of the other Americans with me, hey, anybody want to go back there and explore the bunker? So we, we did that a couple of different times. <laughs> a matter of fact, it became a regular thing that I took my uh, college volunteers down mm -hmm. to the bunker. And some of us would come out home saying that was their favorite part of the week is to getting to explore underground. <laughs> awesome. So you mentioned that you you work for a nonprofit then? Yes, uh, my full job is is as office manager for a nonprofit organization, and we are particularly active in um, East, Eastern Europe, uh, Belarus, Ukraine, uh, the the Republic of Georgia, uh, Russia also. Um, so it nowadays, you know, with a war going on between two of these countries, I've got very good friends in Ukraine. And I've got mm -hmm. some very good friends in Russia. And it, it hurts me really to, to mm -hmm. see those two countries going at it like this. Uh, I, I pray for the war to end, but I also pray for all my friends that I personally know to stay alive because there's just so yeah. many people that uh, have been perishing. It's a, a very sad situation. Mm -mm. So you hold a degree in foreign language education and speak Russian. So right. which and Russian I, goes I, with the area that you're that your nonprofits yes. in. Uh, even that is kind of ironic because I started out, uh, I started out in a family where nobody spoke any foreign language. Mm -hmm. And uh, in ninth grade, I, when I was signing up for my classes, I had like, room for one, one course of my, whatever I wanted to choose and one elective. Out of the thin air, I, I chose French one. Mm -hmm. And I, at the beginning of that year, I was like C plus, B minus, not so hot at French. Uh, but by January, it's like something in my brain turned and like the, the, the tumblers of a lot clicking into place. It fell into place. And it's like all of a sudden, I get it. I understand why this word, this word has this form. And this word has this form. Talk about verbs in particular. And mm -hmm. uh, so my sophomore year of high school, I signed up for French 2 and Spanish 1. I, I thought I'm really having oh. fun with this language stuff. My third year, I signed up for French 3. French, uh, Spanish two, German one. And it oh, got to wow. the point where my counselor was saying, I'm getting kind of leery about all this foreign language. You're getting too heavily weighted in one direction. Uh, but by the time <laughs> I graduated, I received a, a certificate of special achievement in foreign language. And I was planning to become a French teacher. Mm. But uh, it was when I was in college, I took an interest in the Russian language uh, and uh, began taking uh, after i graduated actually and i became a, a textbook editor i started taking a, a nighttime course in russian language at clemson university in south carolina and so from that beginning uh, i eventually volunteered to work at this nonprofit, and uh, they interviewed me flew me up to o'hare airport in chicago and interviewed me and uh at at that time the, the president of that the organization uh, he's passed away since then but he said i, I would like you to come 
But the next thing out of his mouth was, but we have a, a, a problem in our office with communication because he was from a Russian background and always needed an interpreter. And uh, most of the other people were Americans, except for his daughter, who also worked there. So he asked, would you be willing to continue studying Russian if the office pays for it? And I, told him, I just audited two semesters. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep going. And so, uh, of course. <laughs> somebody else paid for me to continue my training in, in Russian language. And that eventually led to taking trips over there and doing different administrative things and, and eventually to uh, participating in children's camps, uh, ferrying funds back and forth. And so it's it's been very different, uh, a different kind of a life, but very rewarding too. So, and then my freelance writing is just all on the side, nothing to do with really my work at all, except that I do write the, 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 the newsletters for our organization and some mm -hmm. correspondence, things like that. So with your writing, do you, are you a plotter? Do you have an outline and all of that? Or are you just, or do you write by the seat of your pants or is it, a combination that's a good question and for, for people who are not writers or are just beginning writers they might not have heard of it. but there is a, a particular expression called a pantser mm -hmm. and uh, people come to me and say like what's a pantser it, it sounds like a, <laughs> a, a black cat from africa but it's not a panther it's a pantser yeah uh, people who who write by the seat of their pants and, and they don't know from one page to the next exactly where the story is going but uh i'm not exactly one camp or the other, I'm kind of in the middle. Okay. And my, my personal style is that before I even begin to sit down to write chapter one, I will be collecting ideas. I will have a story idea that's kind of uh, stewing in my head. And I keep dropping this, like making a stew on the stovetop. I keep dropping in bits of this and bits of that and ideas and, and the kind of swirl around and see how that cooks up together. But before I begin writing, I will have a, a separate folder with all kinds of information that I have collected. That information, in some cases, has been about Eastern Europe, about France, about Germany. Um, sometimes it has been um, debriefing sessions with, uh, uh, th this is something I didn't know existed, but you can find online government debriefing sessions where uh, pilots would come back from their bombing raids over Germany and they would have a go to a debriefing hut and uh, they would ask them oh, to describe what happened on the mission and, and uh, you know, what kind of success or failures they had, what they saw. And those things are recorded. They're still available. And so I found that kind of information just invaluable for me. And I kind of reworded and duplicated some of it for some of my books. Uh, but um, so I have a lot of information and I have an idea for a story. I usually know where I want my story to begin. I know mm -hmm. how I want my story to end. And I have a lot of ideas for what I want to happen in the middle along the way. Okay. But I don't have, I do not have a complete outline. So as I write, <laughs> basically, I, I have I try to craft a, an eye-catching, interest catching beginning. Mm -hmm. And then from there I start connecting the dots and, and so it's partially plotted out for me, but there's enough space between those plot points that I have to do some discovery. <laughs> and I, I can remember one day, uh, one of my uh, one of my heroes from this book, mm -hmm. he grew up in an Indianapolis uh, orphanage, and from a young youngest age, he felt like he was meant to fly, born to fly. He says. But he never knew why, and he never knew who his, who his parents were. Mm. And one day I was driving down the road, and I had this, like, uh, eureka moment where all of a sudden I realized who his parents in the story were. And I pulled out my phone, and I called a friend, and I said, I, I finally figured out who Roger Green's parents are. And this friend, after a long pause, said, who's Roger Green? <laughs> and I said, the main character in the book I'm writing. And then another long pause, like, okay. I was excited, but I can't expect somebody else to be excited just because I am. Uh, there are those moments of discovery that are just exciting, in, at least in the, the mind of the author, when mm -hmm. things start to click into place and all of a sudden you have the, the answer to something that's been like a stumbling block. <laughs> so do you have any more books planned out or in the... I am on one at the moment, and uh, it will be... Once again, it involves a pilot, but it's contemporary, but it's much more of a, a, a Hallmark type story than anything else I've read before, uh, written before. 
Now, now these books do have a light thread of romance in them, but romance is not the main thing. Mm -hmm. But I'm working on a story now at the prompting of my literary agent who said, I think you could turn out a really good romantic story. Well, I hadn't really considered that before. And the, as you know by now, that I, I considered more my, my main type of favorite hero would be like a military type character. But I am writing a story now. I'm about 42,000 words into it about a former Air Force pilot who has been writing, uh, flying for Hollywood, being a stunt man, stunt flyer for movies, mm -hmm. and uh, about how he gets burned by a woman who just was using him as a stepping stone to get introduced to producers and directors. And he gets all upset about the, the, the plasticness, the, the, the false smiles and everything of Hollywood. And he leaves. He decides he's going to just throw a dart into a map and go wherever it is. And it lands in Danville, Indiana. And so he flies his private little black biplane from Los Angeles to Danville and doesn't know that love is waiting for him there. So it's, uh, it's different for me. I have, I have done my research in this case by watching some Hallmark movies. Uh, but, but it is fun. It, it is fun to, to look, spread your wings, you know, and exercise mm -hmm. a, a new kind of genre. And uh, but but once again, keeping the continuity of an Air Force military vet. Very good. That that sounds really interesting. Um, Hallmark does have a certain formula to all of their movies. You know, and, yeah, and, and writers joke about those formulas quite often. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My husband always jokes that, you know, why can't she just hold a job? Because they use the same actors <laughs> for multiple movies. You know, she's by the baker, she's by this and that. Right. <laughs> it's like, well, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, the fans do get attached to certain actors. Yes. At, at least for that kind of a genre. Yeah. So, um, so you mentioned you have a literary agent. So did you self-publish any of these small press publish? Or are you with a bigger publishing house? Or? Okay. Um, I have gone uh, both um, for people who are not involved in publishing, but they might not have ever even thought about it, but the traditional publishers, you know, the Harcourt, the random house, those mm -hmm. kind of places. Uh, you can't really just, send them your, your manuscript like you mm -hmm. could 20 or 30 years ago. You have to have a literary agent who is basically the filter for those bigger mm -hmm. houses. And if it, if a submission comes through an agent, they figure, okay, somebody has basically vetted this. Somebody is betting that this is a good quality story, not just good, but uh, an exceptional quality story. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if it comes from an agent, they will take a look at it. That doesn't mean that they'll buy it. They might not offer you a contract, but at least they'll take a closer look at it instead of just sending it back as a un unrequested manuscript. Mm. Um, but I, so I've had two accepted um, at a smaller presses mm -hmm. and um, well, actually, yeah, uh, I have to recount you. Yeah, two accepted traditionally. And then uh, for my third one, I decided, not the third one, excuse me, I'm just getting mixed up because I hadn't expected that question. But my third <laughs> one was also traditionally published, uh, but it was my fourth one and fifth one that I thought, I'm, I used to be a textbook editor. I worked hand in hand with the arts department. I worked hand in hand with the various other people in publishing. So I thought mm -hmm. I should be able to do this. And mm -hmm. so uh, I self-published the, the fourth one and the fifth one. But uh, that, that does put a lot more mm, burden on the author because you have to be in charge of hiring a graphics person to create your, your cover illustrations and do not fall for the temptation to save money by doing your own artwork. This You don't want it to look childish or amateurish. You, you want something that looks really good. And uh, you, you have to hire some editorial help. Here, I used to be an editor. I worked for five years as an editor. Uh, that was my profession. But every writer has their blind spots and you can be weak in an area and not know that you're weak in that mm -hmm. area. And you need somebody with an, a professional, objective eye to read your work and say, stop doing this. You've already used this word <laughs> 50 times, just oh, whatever the case may be. And mm -hmm. uh, so, so you need a to hire a professional editor, at least one. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you, you're just in charge of uh, finding the ISB number, um, 
there's lots and lots of decisions that go make into that go into self-publishing. And so I think I prefer traditional publishing, but you know, those traditional publishers, they've got their their time set up for the print runs of books each year. There's only a limited number of slots, a limited number of publications, manuscripts that they can accept. And if they've already got their quota for the year filled up, that's it's just too bad. They just can't squeeze yours in no matter mm -hmm. how good quality it is. And, yeah. and so nowadays we have what are called hybrids. Yep. Uh, authors, authors who have traditionally published books and but also have self-published books just because the traditional publishers had no more room in their schedule, no more press time available. And rather than wait another year for them to maybe have mm -hmm. press time, they just proceeded to, to go ahead with their knowledge and expertise and uh, trust that the readers who will like their kind of work will find them. Awesome. Well, this has been great. I've enjoyed our conversation. I, uh, so you're going to be reading at the event and yes. I've got you down for um, the book cover contest. So you'll be reading the Methuselah project. Yes. But you'll be the book cover contest is the other book. Yes, the I, I forget. Did I submit this one? Yes. For the, the next fifth end. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's the one. That sci-fi piece. Yep. And I, I think that's a very sharp, sharp looking mm -hmm. cover. I can say that because I had no nothing to do with designing it. That that was all <laughs> a, a professional artist who was in that. Uh, well, also I. I so look forward to meeting you in person in November and we're going to have a great time. Yes, we are. We are going. I don't know what the weather will be that day. It might be chilly, but we are going to have an excellent time in Milford, Michigan. <laughs> I will see you then, Rick. Okay. Thank you so much for this invitation. Enjoy it.